I don't need to say very much about Seth. You're a rock star. You are I such you. a rock star. I'm so nervous. <laughs> I don't need to tell you much about Seth. Uh, his reputation precedes him, but he's, I guess, suffice to say, a thought leader, um, successful author, and uh, is inspired me from his very first book. So take it away. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Brian is. Uh, Persistent and generous and intelligent and a, a, a real uh, uh, a mensch and a, a pleasure to work with. So th thank you, Brian. Um, all right. So I want to start by asking you a pretty serious question. I don't want you to answer it out loud, but I want you to answer it honestly to yourself. I want you to think really hard as we get started. And the question is really simple. Are you a genius? <laughs> it's a little uncomfortable. If you do a search on Google for is a genius, all these pictures show up of people from all walks of life. The thing is, Albert Einstein sort of ruined the whole genius thing for people. <laughs> because we got this feeling that in order to be a genius, you have to revolutionize quantum mechanics or physics or something that we don't even understand. And I'm here to talk about a different way of thinking about that. And I'm here to talk about a fundamental shift in the world that we live in. I did a word map of some of the writing I've done in the last two years. And what I discovered is the thing I write about the most is not uh, marketing or making money. It's people. Over the last few years, I've been hearing from a lot of people, some of you in this room. And what I've been hearing from people has changed. And it's changed because something has changed in the world. It used to be that one guy, this is John Hammond, the person who discovered Bruce Springsteen and Aretha Franklin and lots of other acts. One guy had the leverage to really make a difference in an organization and in the world. But what occurred, and we're going to talk about why, is we switched to a world of factory farming. We switched to a world of factory factories. We switched to a world where business was about building systems that made money. The most important person of the 20th century, when they look back 500 years from now, is this guy. You may not recognize him as Henry Ford. What Henry Ford did that was so important is he figured out how to build a system called the Ford system that enabled him to take a 50 cent a day man and give him enough leverage and enough productivity that he could afford to pay that guy $5 a day. Henry Ford single-handedly increased the wages of people in Detroit who had skills by a factor of 10 in one day. And the line outside the factory was huge. Henry Ford could afford to pay people five bucks because he was making 30 bucks or 40 bucks or 50 bucks from every day they worked. The system was the king. The system was all about getting stuff done fast and productively. That it turns out that factories a factory that sells insurance, a factory that's an ad agency, a factory that makes cars, a factory that raises money for nonprofits, a factory that makes clothes, a factory that sells clothes. They're all factories. Factories are efficient systems that take inputs from people and produce money because they're productive. They weren't always here. Only 130 years ago, this was the most complicated device sold in the United States to typical consumers. The Singer sewing machine, incredibly complex. If you broke a piece, you had to replace either the whole machine or get a craftsman to make you the piece. You could, there were no replacement parts because everything was hand fit together. If you went to the hardware store in 1860 and bought a nut and a bolt and you picked up one nut and one bolt, they would not fit together. Everything was hand fit. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson and some folks in France figured out that this idea of interchangeable parts was going to revolutionize the world. And it took 100 years for our culture to figure out interchangeable parts. That was replaced by this idea of interchangeable people. Because once the system is up and running, and you've got a cash register there, and you've built the store and paid the rent and stocked it up, you don't want to depend the whole thing on that cashier. You want an interchangeable cashier, right? She quits, you replace her five minutes later, no big deal. AT&T had to deal with this in 1940. They did the math, and at the rate AT&T was using operators, they calculated that half 
the women in America would be working as an AT&T operator within 10 years. <laughs> so the entire model of our economy, number one, based on efficient factories and replaceable workers. Number two, the biggest problem that faced industrialists in 1910 and 1920 was not what you think. Like today you open the paper and the problems that come up again and again are global unrest and global warming. In those days, the thing they all talked about, overproduction. They were all lobbying each other hard to make less stuff because factories were so efficient. They were worried we would not be able to buy everything they made, which is funny now when you look at a walk-in closet in Orange County. Right? <laughs> Mariah Carey has a thousand shoes in her closet. What we did, capitalists, industrialists, was set out to figure out how to get people to buy lots of stuff. And the second thing we needed to do was make sure that the workers were willing to be interchangeable, to be compliant, to be cogs in the system. So here are the two problems. We got to train people to buy more stuff, and we got to train people to work in a factory to do what they're told. And the solution, of course, public school. And we invented school. <laughs> Universal schooling is only 150 years old. Before it, the typical kid owned one pair of shoes and one pair of pants. And they went to school, and we taught them that buying stuff helped them fit in. And before it, you worked in the family business if there was one. You know, J.S. Bach, his kids grew up to be classical composers. If your father was a farmer, you were going to be a, father, a farmer. If your father made pottery, you were going to make pottery. But instead, we built this system to teach people to fit in. And the reason is because if you fit in, they can ignore you. If you fit in, you become a compliant cog in a giant machine. Right? Could I just ask anyone who's using a camera to turn it off? Because I have a lot of problems with lights and flashing stuff and even video. That would really help me out a lot. I would appreciate it. Um, OK. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Yes. The other thing, though, is this system was brand new. For 50,000 years, human beings did not have an idea that you would leave home, move to a city, and work in a factory. So we had to train people to believe this stuff. Here's the truth about electricity. When they built the first homes with electricity, they thought the only thing anyone would do is have a single light bulb. And so the only thing in your house that had electricity in it was the light bulb. Then they invented the washing machine. Now, washing machines were a boon. The problem is there was no place to plug them in. So every washing machine came with a 30-foot long extension cord. You put the washing machine on your porch, and you ran the extension cord in your house, and you screwed it in. And hundreds of people a year died from washing machine accidents because you would either like jolt yourself or the machine would move a little bit on the porch, and it would wrap around your neck. And it was not good. So they had to train people how to deal with this new system. So, What's the problem? The problem is this is adjusted for inflation, the wage of the compliant worker in America, basic unskilled labor, 1960 to 2005, totally unchanged for 45 years. And why not? We keep making more workers, and they're all the same. They're interchangeable. You're an insurance adjuster. You're a senior vice president for international affairs. Whatever your top title is. The whole idea was, give me a resume. Make sure I can scan it in. Then once I scan in the resume, I'll be able to compare the keywords and figure out the person who's the most compliant for this position and hire them. So let's look at the evolution of where we've been so far. The first thing was, we were hunters. We were hunters for a really long time. Then a lot of people became farmers. And then a lot of people moved to the city and became compliant cogs in the industrial system. And my argument, my plea to you, and the reason I came here tonight is because now there's a new class of person, an artist. And when I say artist, I don't mean artist the way you might think of artist. When I say artist, I mean somebody who does human work, unpredictable work, makes a connection with someone else, and changes them for the better. So you can be an artist if you're a painter, but maybe not. But you can also be an artist if you're a receptionist. And you can be an artist if you're a troubleshooter. And you can be an artist if you're a fundraiser. That what art is is the opposite of being the compliant cog. 
So here's one way to think about it. Picasso is on a train uh, in the, on going through the plains of Spain in the 1930s. And there's another guy in the compartment with him. And he recognizes Picasso and screws up his courage. And he goes to him and he says, excuse me, are you the great artist uh, Pablo Picasso? And Picasso, not shy, says, sure, that's me. And the guy goes on and on about how big a fan he is of Picasso. He says, but you know, my wife, she doesn't like your work so much. <laughs> and Picasso says, what do you mean? My wife, she wonders why you paint such weird paintings. Why can't you just paint things as they are? Picasso says, that's interesting. Your wife, what does she look like? And the guy pulls out his wallet and, pulls, and shows a picture of him and his wife. He says, here she is. And Picasso looks at it and says, wait a minute. She's very small and flat, too. <laughs> that what Picasso did for a living was he did not become a replacement for the camera. We had cameras. We didn't need someone to become a, re a system who would just paint things as they were. He painted things as he saw them. And that what painting became, what art became, what plays became, is the work of a human being who's doing something that someone else couldn't do. Right? The first guy who installed the urinal into an art museum was a Dadaist, a master. The second guy who does it is merely a plumber. <laughs> right? And the difference in the way we value those people is, is extraordinary. When Steely Dan came out with this record, it wasn't like anything on the market at the time. You can hear two notes from one of these songs and you instantly remember it. It's not like all the other stuff, because they did something tricky. They did something scary. If you go to Per Se restaurant in New York, you'll wait two months for a reservation. You'll pay $250 to eat there. But the person who made the meal, who designed the pottery, who thought about your experience was an artist. And so is the receptionist at an extraordinary company, one who actually makes you feel welcome, as opposed to just someone who's doing their job. Or so are the fellows at the Acumen Fund, people who come from all over the world to spend a couple months thinking about how to lead social organizations. Artists aren't necessarily people who can draw. There's a village in China called Dauphin. And Dauphin, according to one estimate, creates one third of all the oil paintings in the world. And what happens, true Chinese style, there's lots of people there. The sun rises, everyone runs outside and starts painting oil paintings. And I own one. It looks a little like this. Um, <laughs> I bought it on eBay for $60. Now, the thing is that if art, if painting is your job, it's not art. It's paint by numbers. And that's an interesting item, but it's not one that we value very highly, because anybody could do it. Right? This, on the other hand, is a photo from the recent Mars lander. To visualize what it would take to send something to another planet, take photos, and send them back. There was no manual for how to do that. People who can figure it out are worth something. So if I had to boil it down to just a few words, it's this simple. If I can write down what you need to do, if I can give you the map, then I can find someone to do it cheaper. And I will. And I don't care what your profession is. If you're a radiologist, as soon as x-rays become digital, they just did, I can send that x-ray anywhere I want. Why will I have you read it just because you're nearby? There's a McDonald's near here where when you go to the drive-thru and you call in your order through that little box, it goes by ISDN to South Dakota, where someone in South Dakota speaks to you like they're inside the McDonald's. They type in your order, and it goes right back to the McDonald's you're sitting in. It's cheaper for McDonald's to do that than to hire someone in California to do it for them. And as soon as South Dakota gets too expensive, it'll go to someone who speaks even better English in Bangalore. <laughs> right? <laughs> So we look at this and we get really nervous because it's one thing to give something away and it's another thing to say, wait, I worked really hard on this. I need to charge extra. And what the market's going to say to you is, you know what? You can try to charge extra, but if all hugs are the same, I'll take these hugs. Thank you very much. This guy's in trouble. Part of the challenge here is this. You don't want to try to get ahead in bowling. And the reason is the best you can do in bowling is 300. It's an asymptotic function. 
You can't bowl 320. You can't be a bowling superstar because there's so many people who are so close to perfect. What are you going to do if you're in the bottled water business? Make your water more boring, more wetter? What? There's nothing left, <laughs> right? Or maybe there's a little bit left, but not a lot. <laughs> and so let me get a little economic geeky on you here, because I think that there's an important inflection point in our world, and you're present for it, and it's either an opportunity or a bane or a curse. This is Karl Marx, one of the Marx brothers, the least famous. <laughs> and that's Adam Smith. Karl Marx and Adam Smith saw a machine. It's a pin-making machine. Adam Smith writes about it in the first chapter of his book. Before the pin-making machine, those little metal things they put in the shirt, right? They put two in when they make it, and when you, by the time you get it, they've reproduced, and there's 18 all in there. <laughs> a talented pin-maker could make eight pins a day. And so you paid them a fair amount because it wasn't easy to make pins. After the pin making machine was made, four untalented people with 10 minutes of training could make 10,000 pins a day. So Adam Smith looked at this and said, this is great. Go buy a pin making machine. And Karl Marx looked at this and said, careful, because if you work for a guy who owns a pin making machine, you're in really big trouble. And they were both exactly right. That what happened is two classes of people. Orange County is filled with a lot of people who own machines and systems and factories, <laughs> right? And there are a lot of places in the world, including Orange County, where a bunch of people are just stuck. Two teams, owners, workers. Marx said, that's lousy. We need worldwide revolution because the system won't go away without it. And Smith said, go buy yourself a machine. <laughs> Something just changed. And what just changed is this, anybody with 800 bucks or access to a public library, now is both. You own the machine, it gives you access to the world-class tools of the internet. It gives you access to every consumer in the world. It gives you access to world-class writing tools, world-class connection tools. You can create something in 3D uh, CAM software and send it over to China and get prototypes right back. It changes everything because now there's a third team. And the third team are the people who are both workers and owners. And I call those people linchpins. Those are people who are artists. Those are people who are doing stuff we can't live without. Those are people who are taking intellectual risks, not doing physical labor. Those are people that in the future are going to be glad they made the choice to be those people. Here's the thing. You can't be a coal miner without a coal mine. And very few coal miners own their own coal mine. But you can be a recombinant DNA scientist for 300 bucks. You can order it on the internet and do the science on your kitchen table. So something fundamentally has shifted. The wall has come down between owners and workers, right? That what happens is the internet, this massive connection of everything, means two things are going on. One, if you're average, there's a race to the bottom. Hint, you cannot win a race to the bottom. And if you're an extraordinary person, there's a race to the top, which is a lot more fun. So let's say you want to make a video or write a book, or start a radio station, or sell handmade crafts. Here's the bad, scary thing. No one can say no to you anymore. You don't have to say, I got rejected by that publisher. The FCC won't give me a license. I can't get to the crafts fair. No one on NBC will put my show online. Just do it. You can go. There's no one to blame it on anymore. So Shepard Ferry, a brilliant artist, has built this career out of pointing out to people, you really don't have to obey anymore. We don't have an obedience shortage. Right? I would like to argue that obedience is largely for dogs. <laughs> I have one of the world's largest collections of cafeteria lady photos. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is my favorite one. I think they're prison cafeteria ladies. I'm not sure. <laughs> so the thing is, it really sucks to be a cafeteria lady. Cafeteria ladies are abused by the customers. They're not paid very well. They have to wear the attractive clothing. <laughs> they don't get free haircuts at the company store. All these things, but guess what? They all grew up playing a board game called Candyland. <laughs> that from the time they were two, we've been training kids to pick a card, move the pieces, 
and work their way through the whole game. That is the entire set of rules of Candyland, right? There is no judgment calls. There's no imagination. Pick a card, move your thing, next person's turn. And it's so much easier to give a kid Candyland or a TV than it is to give them a block of wood and say, go do something creative. Right? Go play in traffic. Go start a fire. Go, go do dangerous things with the microwave oven. We don't do that. You know why? Because our parents didn't do that. Our parents raised us to be compliant because that was the system. And it worked for a long time. For a long time, a guy, one guy I mentioned in the book in Denver, was making $80,000 a year as a middle manager, moving pieces of paper from one pile to another for a Fortune 500 company. And the Fortune 500 company got under price pressure, so they laid him off with 10,000 other people, all of whom were innocent because they followed instructions. And now this guy makes $12 an hour working at the 7-Eleven. Where did the $70,000 difference go? Right? Well, it went because he was complying. It disappeared. He didn't change. What changed was the system. Speaking of the system, two interesting things happened in the 1770s. One, a guy invented a magic trick called the Mechanical Turk. And what the Mechanical Turk was, was a chess set where the king would come out and move and the machine would move magically. And it was a sensation in Europe. All the kings and stuff were busy playing chess with it. The same year, they started the Encyclopedia Britannica. And $100 million later, the Encyclopedia Britannica made its way through 200 years of building the world's most important reference book with hundreds of editors checking all this stuff, doing exactly what they were told. And then a guy named Jimmy Wales came along and using what I call the law of the mechanical Turk, built Wikipedia for free. <laughs> right? Because if you can break a task into sufficiently small little bits, you can get people to do each little bit, basically, for free. So Jimmy Wales didn't say, write the article on Abraham Lincoln. He said, edit the third sentence of the second paragraph of the article on Abraham Lincoln. And anyone could do that for free. About the time Wikipedia was gathering speed, Amazon started a service called Mechanical Turk. And what Mechanical Turk does is it lets you go online and register and do little tiny tasks for a nickel or a dime or 50 cents. In the last year, the percentage of people who do Mechanical Turk tasks who live in the United States has doubled. That there are endless people who are lining up. Here's a picture of people who do Mechanical Turk. A guy posted on Mechanical Turk, I will pay you 25 cents if you write on a piece of paper why you use Mechanical Turk, take your picture and upload it. Right? It's one of the many little tiny brainless tasks that you get asked to do on Mechanical Turk. <laughs> My point is that we're turning every job into a Mechanical Turk job. That's what the owner of the factory needs to do because his competition is doing the same thing. So my friend Jessica would draw it like this. <laughs> so I think there's a hierarchy here. And it's a hierarchy you might be familiar with. The lowest thing you can do to get paid for is lifting. Anyone can do it. Then there's hunting. Then there's growing stuff, producing stuff, selling stuff which is really hard because people are afraid to do it, connecting other people, because that takes the work of the heart, and finally creating and inventing stuff, which no one ever taught us how to do. And school is the problem. School is a scam. School was built by industrialists to train our kids to buy stuff to fit in and to follow instructions. So true story. I don't know if you know this bird. Have you ever seen this bird thing, right? So what happens is, the bird dips into the water over and over and over again. So I'm sitting with five kids, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old, and I say, put the bird down, I set it up. How does bird work, I say? Awkward silence. Rebecca turns to me and says, I don't know, how does it work? Ready to take notes. I said, Rebecca, we don't need people to take notes anymore. The answer is in Wikipedia. Who cares when the War of 1812 was? I can look it up. You don't need to memorize anything anymore. And it was a half hour of pain before I got these five kids to ask enough questions on their own to figure out how the drinking bird did its job over and over and over again. And my guess is most of your kids can't do that same thing. Bring home the bird and say, how does it work? And let them figure it out. Not tell you what they learned, not regurgitate the textbook, but tell you how they figured it out. The problem is we want kids to fit in 
And we encourage them to go to Abercrombie to buy more stuff so they can fit in even more. <laughs> and the problem with fitting in is that all it means if you get A's is that you're good at school. And you don't get to do school after you're done with school, <laughs> right? The boss doesn't say, we're going to have a test on Friday and I want you to regurgitate everything you learned for the last four weeks. <laughs> That's not what happens. My friend Ben Zander has written a brilliant book called The Art of Possibilities with his wife. I, you should all go read it immediately. And in it, there's an essay called Give Yourself an A. Ben teaches very stressed out type A violin students. He's the conductor for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Um, yeah, Boston Philharmonic, one of the two. Anyway, he teaches these type A violin students. And they walk in the class shaking, because they're straight A students. And he's a tough uh, guy. And he wants to teach them to play with their heart. So he says the first day, everyone in class, give yourself an A. You all have an A. All you have to do is write an essay, one page long, of date it on the last day of class, but hand it in today, why, what you did to deserve the A. And if you give me the essay, you get your A. And it takes all the pressure off, and then people can play. I think the book is great, but I think you should give yourself a D. I think if you give yourself a D and acknowledge the fact that you already failed, now maybe you could go do something interesting. <laughs> what do you got to lose? You already failed. And it's really scary to give ourselves a D. Here's the problem. The problem is that if you spend your time following instructions, you have to work 14 hours a day for not much money. Richard Branson, you know him, the multi-billionaire guy? He only works five minutes a day. <laughs> the rest of the time, they parade him around to do stuff, but it's only five minutes a day that he does the stuff he gets paid for. You're laughing. He doesn't fly the planes. He just invented the idea of having the planes. That only took five minutes. The rest of it is the detail work. But you've been brainwashed into thinking that you have to wait for someone to show up and hand you an assignment. Uh, uh, my friend Melissa said, look, just because the tide is out doesn't mean there's any less water in the ocean. And the economy goes out and the economy goes in. And if you say when the economy's out, oh, I better hunker down and fit in or I'll get fired, you should ask the 20,000 people at Ford Motor Company who hunkered down and fit in and got fired. <laughs> right? Because it's going to happen if you fit in enough, we'll just replace you. You're not looking for a path. If there's a path, then everyone's on it. You're looking for choices. The scarecrow at the crossroads. The more choices there are, the more chances you have to do something interesting and remarkable. All right, shifting gears a little bit. This is Charles Krulak. He's the short guy, United States Marine Corps. He invented Krulak's Law. What he realized is that World War I and World War II were won by generals. Generals who figured out strategies, who built the factory of war. And the wars that we're unfortunately in right now are, run, are being won by the man in the street, the woman who's knocking on the door. The lowest paid person in the entire force is the one who's winning or losing the battle. And if you think about your company, your organization, the places you go to buy french fries or dry clean or anything else, the whole business is built around the lowest paid person in the whole thing. Kulak's Law says it's the one who's interfacing with the public. That's where remarkable experiences are made. And that's the challenge. Because we spend all the time saying to those people, you're replaceable. You're paid as little as possible. You don't like it, leave. And then we expect them to be amazing. Then we expect them to do art, to connect. So I'm not here to say you must be an entrepreneur. I'm not here to say you have to start your own business. The guy on the left is my friend Sasha at Acumen Fund. He's a fundraiser. He's an artist. This guy is Jay Parkinson. You can Google him. He's reinventing medicine, the whole thing by himself, <laughs> right? Because he's not waiting for some central authority to say, this is the new rules of medicine. He's saying, in my own little way, I'm going to practice medicine differently. And if I practice medicine differently and it works, the word will spread. And if the word spreads, people will show up and other people will copy me. They are what I'm calling linchpins, people we can't live without, people who take real risks, not financial risks, but emotional risks. They're artists. So what do I mean when I say artists? Well, maybe Andy Warhol was an artist, though he wouldn't really paint. I'm going to argue Warren Buffett is an artist. Warren Buffett doesn't have to tell us all the stuff he tells us. He could just be this anonymous billionaire, but he's not. He's sharing stuff. He's teaching us stuff. That what artists do, in addition to changing people, is they give gifts. Art is based on the idea that there's an exchange of gifts, not a financial exchange. And here's the reason. When I sell you something, 
We're done. Even Stephen. You give me money, I give you the thing. It's over. We're now farther apart. What art needs to do is bring us closer together. Right? Art is this connection that comes from one person making a gift to another. That doesn't mean that people who do art get nothing. They get lots of things in the long run. But in the short run, you must be willing to give something extra. So if you fly jet blue from Long Beach to New York, you are paying to get from Long Beach to New York. For free, you get smiles. For free, you get a flight attendant who spends an extra 10 seconds to make you glad you're on the flight. For free, you see the pilot come out and soothe a kid who's got a stomach ache. Right? That's not part of the thing. And no one stands up on the flight and says, what do I owe you for smiling at me? It's the art of doing it when you're not required that makes a difference. There's a coffee shop in London called Proof Rock Coffee. And they have one of those frequent buyer cards that you've seen everywhere. They punch it. But theirs is different. In order to get a free coffee at Proof Rock, you have to get it checked off at their eight biggest competitors. <laughs> right? So what they've done is they've given a gift to the competition. They say to their customers, go, try all our competition. Once you've tried them all, come back, and we'll be happy to give you a free coffee. <laughs> That's transformative. I went to see Levon Helm in concert uh, a couple weeks ago. And I noticed, I recognized the guy playing the piano who made 100 bucks that night, Walter from uh, Steely Dan on the piano. Donald Fagan, I'm sorry, not Walter. Donald Fagan on the piano, working for free. What's that about? Shouldn't he be charging a fortune? No. He wasn't doing it to make money. He was doing it to make a difference. He was doing it to pay back Levon Helm. He was doing it to be in front of the artist. That when an artist realizes they have abundance, that they're not going to run out of ideas, that they're not going to run out of smiles, that they're not going to run out of the idea of connection. They realize, wait, I better give some of this stuff away or it's going to spoil. That this idea of abundance instead of scarcity flies in the face of owning a factory. Factories are all about scarcity. Why would anyone buy something if they didn't need it? But what people who make art realize is that the more they give away, the more they touch people, the more they change people, the better they do. So this idea of day's work for day's pay is bogus. That what we need to do instead is figure out how to have this posture of change and posture of generosity. So why is this so hard? Because 80% of you think I'm completely full of it. It's hard because it's scary. It's hard because it flies in the face of what we think will work. It's hard because people might laugh at us. <laughs> right? And there's a reason, biological reason, and it's this. The lizard brain. Why did the chicken cross the road? Because its lizard brain told it to. If you look at the evolution of the brain, it's really straightforward. Lizards and chickens. This is, by the way, the deluxe rubber chicken, America's number one rubber chicken. <laughs> a lot of rubber chickens are really stiff and they'll abrade your skin. This is good rubber chicken. <laughs> anyway, the, the lizard brain in the chicken is in charge of revenge, fear, anger and reproduction. That's all it does. And we have one too. It's right near the brain stem. Near, it includes the amygdala and other parts of our brain. It's the first part of the brain that develops in the fetus and then the other parts develop on top of it. So we got a brain that wants to make music and we got a brain that wants to have a conversation and then we have a brain that wants to run away. And we have a brain that wants to fit in and a brain that wants not to be laughed at and a brain that wants to get revenge and a brain that wants to have kids. And anytime that brain wants to speak up, the lizard brain, it wins because it's what got us here. And here's the bad news. The bad news is the thing that protected us from saber-toothed tigers, keeping us from getting thrown out of the village, the reason that we're here is now wrecking our lives. It is sabotaging our ability to do the work that's actually going to work. My friend Steve Pressfield calls it the resistance. The resistance is that voice that says, I'm afraid of public speaking. That voice says, I don't want to have that honest conversation with that guy I work with because it might not work. I'll do it tomorrow. The resistance is the one that says, I better go check Twitter instead of writing that essay. Because someone might have said something on Twitter that would really be helpful. And if I do that, I'll build a bigger social network. And then when I finally write my essay, it'll go fine. The resistance <laughs> is the one that's responsible for writer's block. Do you notice no one ever gets plumber's block? Right? 
You call up the plumber, he shows up, he says, you got any whiskey? I don't think I feel like plunging that toilet. <laughs> That's not what happens. But writer's block, we go, oh, of course, it's so hard. You have to hold the pen. <laughs> so in addition to my cafeteria lady photos, I have the largest collection of baseball bats flying into the stands photos. <laughs> Now, this, my favorite is like, here's the big baseball hero ducking down under the dugout. The bat's way up here. But the lizard brain says, uh-oh, this is really bad news. And, and we don't have any choice. We can't help it. We're hardwired. Here's the good news. This one, the bat didn't really hurt anyone in this one. It's a uh, lens difference. Anyway, the thing is that it's pushing us to fit in. And there are no bats flying at you, I promise. That most of the time, that the very thing you're scared of is the very opportunity that you have to make a difference. OK, true story. I fly from, Boston, from White Plains to Boston. It's a 14-minute flight or something. Finish the, the thing, and I fly back, but there's fog in White Plains. So I land in Albany. Albany's 110 miles away from White Plains. We land at 8 o'clock at night. It's raining. It's clear this plane is not going nowhere. They, it, it's a 16-passenger little toy plane. And we, we pull up to the gate. The airport is basically closed. And they're not letting us off. I, I don't know how long they were hoping to hold us. So they said, you know, it might be two or three hours. We hope to be able to fly to Boston soon. So I've got this little modem thing for my thing. So I can go online wherever I am. And I go online and check out Avis. And I check out Google Maps. And I realize Avis has a car. I reserve it. I can get back to White Plains in, in two hours. So I put my laptop away. I stand up and I say to the flight attendant, I need to leave this plane. And she says, well, you can leave, but you can't come back on. I said, fine with me. And then I turn. I'm wearing a suit. And I turn to everyone on the plane. And I say, hi, my name is Seth. I'm wearing a suit. I've just rented a car from Avis. I'm going to drive to White Plains. I'll be there in an hour and 50 minutes. The car is empty. Anyone want to come? It's free. And I stand there for 15 seconds, and no one says a word. And I leave <laughs> and drive by myself. Right? Why is that? Because of the lizard brain. If you stay, you get to blame United. Right? If you stay and you have a miserable time, it's United's fault. But if you stand up and leave that plane and you can't come back on, then it's your fault. And that's what we want. We want someone to tell us what to do. We want to be more average than average. The lizard brain says, whoa, 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 whoa. You're talking about things that could get me in real trouble. And what I'm saying is, think about every successful person. And I've studied a lot of them. What do they have in common? Successful singers, successful entrepreneurs, successful middle managers. The only thing they have in common is they are successful. That's it. That what they have done is figured out how to go to the edges, how to connect with people, how to make a difference, and how to deal with the lizard brain. And if you have a name for it, the resistance, the voice in your head, then you'll hear it when it shows up. And when it shows up, you'll be able to say to yourself, ah, oh, that's a signal. I'm on the right track. Should Bob Dylan have made that Christmas album, really? <laughs> you know? And the thing is, yeah, he should. Because if Bob Dylan, Dylan doesn't get booed off stage once a decade, he's doing something wrong. right? People still go to Bob Dylan concerts. No one goes to Monkees concerts. Because <laughs> the Monkees keep making the same record over and over and over again. And Bob Dylan's risking getting booed off stage every single day. There's, this wor there's a word for this. Uh, people in Tibet call it Shempa. Shempa is instant anxiety. Shempa is the siren in the back of your thing. So, uh-oh, I'm going to get pulled over. And he's going to realize my insurance has expired. And then he's going to notice something under the glove compartment. And then I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get accused of a crime I didn't commit. I'm going to get convicted. And I'm going to go to jail for the rest of my life. Oh, my God. <laughs> and you've all got Shempa in your life, right? The inner office phone rings, and you see the extension is your boss's boss. <laughs> right? And all anxiety is is experiencing failure in advance. <laughs> That's not good. That'll wear you out. And so you know what we do? We seek reassurance. Please tell me it's going to be OK. 
please, just tell me it's fine, that I'm not going to get in trouble tomorrow. No, I can't give you reassurance, because you know what? There's never enough reassurance for the lizard brain. The lizard brain will not be happy until it's all over and we're dead. That's the lizard brain's job, to not be happy. So where would Philippe be if he let the lizard brain win? Right? I don't know if you've seen this movie or read his book. It's extraordinary. Here's a guy who broke into the World Trade Center while it was under construction and using a bow and arrow shot a cable between the two towers and walked across them, tightrope walking. And you look at why he did it and how he did it and the course of his life. And it's simple. All he does is ignore the lizard brain. Walking across a tightrope that high up is exactly the same as walking across a tightrope this high up, except for the wind, right? <laughs> and, and once you get good at the wind part, you'll be fine. I took, I took a cross-country skiing lesson from a guy who was in the Salt Lake City Olympics. And what Matt taught me, I don't know if you've ever seen skate skiing, it's when they do it like this, you know? What he taught me is the person who wins is the person who leans forward the most. That's the entire sport. Because you don't move until you start leaning forward. And as you're leaning forward, you go, I can't lean forward anymore, and you start moving. And so people who aren't good at it don't lean forward very much. And people who are great at it lean forward so much they often fall on their face until they're really good at it. And if you're going to compete against someone like Matt, you better be prepared to lean forward. So what do we need to teach our kids in school? I think we only need to teach them two things. We need to teach them to solve interesting problems. Right? Why does the bird do that thing? We need to teach them to look at something no one's ever looked at before and come up with an interesting way to solve the problem. They might not be right all the time, but they're way better than the people who refuse to solve it at all. And the second thing we need to do is teach them to connect and to lead and to stand up and say, follow me. And that's really hard because it requires labor. A different kind of labor than this, emotional labor. The labor of doing things you don't feel like. The labor of looking someone in the eye and telling them the truth. The labor of being willing to be laughed at. And this emotional labor is what every single person here who doesn't dig ditches for a living gets paid to do. And most of us aren't very good at it. We've been sliding by. And I'm arguing that we have no choice but to dramatically raise our game. If you want to win a marathon, what you have to do is figure out what to do with the tired. That lots of people run, and some people get overwhelmed by the tired. Someone like Mary Decker figures out a place to put the tired. She puts the tired aside, finishes the race, and she wins. What we've got to do is not figure out where to put the tired. We've got to figure out where to put the scared. Where do we put the resistance? Where do we set it aside and realize the thing we got paid to do is work that matters? That's all we're getting paid to do. And there are plenty of people who are way cheaper than us who are willing to do work that we're told to do. And we look at this and we laugh a little bit and we say, well, that's pretty silly. <laughs> but I think it's important to understand that's all there is. That's the new economy. The industrial era is over. One of the ways we deal with it is what I call Pulitzer Prize fighting. The Pulitzer Prize, as you know, is what they give the people in journalism. And Pulitzer Prize fighting is the irresistible urge to go to an arena where there's lots of competition and there's prizes. Right? So journalists could write lots of different things, but lots of them want to work for the New York Times because that's the right thing to do. And filmmakers can make lots of different kinds of films, but they want it to be at Sundance because that's what the industry pushes them to do. And so we see clumps of people. I can have the most Twitter followers, or I can have a blog that's the number one at this, or we, we, we run with the pack because then you can't blame us. We're doing what everybody else did. But if we look, who's successful? in any industry that's changing, it's someone who did the opposite. There is no prize for what I do, they say. I'm going to go do that. Because doing it first might get me laughed at, but it also might make a difference. It also might create art. So let me tell you seven different ways that linchpins do what they do, and they're very different. One, they create a unique interface between the customer and the organization. If you've got someone in your organization who's the one, like Dolores, who serves more coffee at a certain 7-Eleven in New York than any other 7-Eleven in America, because she knows the name of every single customer, you think they're going to lay Dolores off anytime soon? She's indispensable. She's irreplaceable. Number two, 
is you bring a special kind of creativity to situations that your coworkers can't figure out how to do. Right? That's a skill. You can learn it. You're not born with it. The third one is you know how to manage product projects of great complexity. Right? Think about that person in your office. Doesn't matter how many inputs there are. They can get that movie produced. They can get that project out the door. They can get that conference pulled off. Those people are really hard to find and important to hold on to. The next one is leading customers. Figuring out how to establish a tribe, as Brian talked about today, and take them somewhere. The next one is inspiring staff. That person, at any level in the organization, almost never the CEO, who the rest of the staff will follow to do almost anything. It's hard to live without that person, too. And the sixth one is deep domain knowledge. The geek, the uber geek, the person who knows everything about black ink and the 12 different kinds of Pantone cells and the different specific weights and measures of the whole thing. There aren't very many of those people, and it's really hard to become one. And the seventh one is the one you came in thinking was the only one, and that's being really good at the thing. Anyone recognize this guy? This is the most famous in Australia, talented, over-the-top sportsman who ever lived. His name was Donald Bradman. That chart at the top shows how good Donald Bradman was at cricket compared to everyone else. He was three times better at cricket than Michael Jordan was at basketball. He was four times better at cricket than Tiger Woods was at golf. This guy was the greatest cricket player who ever lived. On average, the rest of the top 50 would get about 50 runs. He got 99. Three standard deviations, five standard deviations higher than the norm. Here's the news flash. You are not Donald Bradman. You will never be, you will never be the Donald Bradman of anything. So stop letting the lizard brain tell you you're not good enough. Yeah, none of us are as good as Donald Bradman. That's okay. You will never play the clarinet as well as Benny Goodman. That's okay, because what we're really looking for is passion. Right? That what what really matters is being willing to stand up and make it happen, to ship. This idea of shipping, of getting it out the door, is so much more powerful than it used to be. Because it used to be that there were all these people who could say, no, it's not ready. And all these people used to say, no, we have to wait. But now it's so easy to get to market that shipping is what matters. Steve McConnell wrote a book. He used to work at Microsoft about the science of software. And what the book says is the typical software product runs late. Duke Nukem, eight years late before they finally canceled the video game for this reason. Here's what happens. You come up with a cool idea and there's only one or two people on the team and things are going really great. The amount of thrashing is really low because everyone knows what's going on. And then you get sort of a lot going on and more people come to the meetings. And then you get more people coming to the meetings, and the CEO shows up and says, wait a minute, we have to redo this. I hate this interface. And so you're going back here. And as it gets closer and closer to ship date, more and more people want to weigh in. And then the lawyers come like here. And they say, oh boy, the lizard is freaking out. What Steve McConnell says is, ship on time by thrashing at the beginning that if you thrash early, if you get all the ideas on post-its before you start putting it into Photoshop and eventually into HTML, your website will be great. But if you don't show the website to the CEO until the day before it goes live because she's too busy, your website's never going to go live. This takes enormous discipline because this is scary and the lizard hates this. <laughs> hates it a lot. So David Rakoff has this great little essay. He was at the movies and there was almost no one there. And he's sitting there, and this woman, this well-dressed woman, comes down, passes eight seats, walks right up to him, and says, excuse me, is this seat taken? <laughs> and she wasn't pointing to the seat next to him. She was pointing to his seat. Is this seat taken? <laughs> and he almost burst into tears. Because it's so easy to look at your job or your passion or whatever it is that you're spending all day on and realize you're taking up the seat, right? that the question I want to ask you is, do you do your work because you got to, it's an obligation, or is it an opportunity? Is it a platform for you to do art? If it's a platform for you to do art, then you can say in every moment, in every exchange, what do I do in this three minutes 
that makes me earn my whole day's pay? What's the scary insight that I come up with, the thing that has nothing to do with a map? And so if we think about these things of art and making a difference and shipping, all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, the economy feels a lot better, right? Because if all we're looking at in the economy is, please give me a job just like my last one, but for more money. And please tell me what to do. And please reassure me that everything is going to be OK. Well, then of course it feels like this. It's over. But if we look at the economy and say, you know what? There's this platform here like nothing has ever been before. Right? A platform that's got nothing in it but opportunity. So here's the question. I want you to think hard before you answer it. And I don't want you to say anything. I just want you to do something. If the answer to this question is yes, stand up. <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. Have a seat. Thank you for standing up. So for those of you who like to take notes, for those of you who want a map, here it is. This is what I need from you. This is what the world needs from you. This is what your family needs from you. This is what your boss needs from you. And if these don't sound hard to you, then you're not telling yourself the truth. <laughs> because there are other people who are working harder at this than you are. Right? So that's where it ends. Where it ends is it's all up to you. That the success of the next generation, including you, including your kids, is going to come down to one thing. Are you a linchpin? Are you doing work that matters? Go do it. Thank you so much.